thank you very much. I hope that you will be still clapping at the end of the talk. The subject matter is so vast and so all-encompassing that in one uh, lecture it is uh, not possible to convey the full breadth and depth of the subject matter. However, I want to begin by highlighting the special time in which we are actually living at this uh, uh, era of the evolutionary cycle of our human uh, journey. It is very important to understand that every now and again there are certain crossover cycles and during those crossover cycles of time there are great uh, possibilities which are open for humanity to accelerate their journey of evolution. Every couple of thousand years there is a changeover from one age into another age and we know now that we have entered the Aquarian age whereas the previous 2000 years was the Piscean age. The Piscean age was inaugurated by this uh, tremendous advent of the Lord Christ manifesting on earth and giving to the world the teaching of love, the teaching that we have to a large extent as human beings misunderstood, misinterpreted, used for our own selfish interest and others have totally confused and uh, uh, really have not been able to absorb the simple message. It's uh, always amazing how human minds make simple simplicity into a very complex thing. The simple message of loving one another and loving the one source of life with all our hearts and minds has been argued over and made so much. Vol volumes of books have been written, libraries are full of books, trying to actually interpret that. Of course, like every religion, it has its deeper esoteric aspects, and the Lord, when he was teaching, he would often say that, uh, for you, my students, it is given to understand the deeper mysteries of life. For the greater public, I speak in parables, and for those who have ears to see, they will see, and for those who have eyes to see, they will see, and ears to hear, they will hear. Therefore, what he was actually saying is that there is an esoteric, a deeper mystery into the Christian faith. And that deeper mystery also existed in the ancient faith from which Christianity uh, drew the sustenance from, which was that of the Hebraic religion, the essence of which is the Kabbalah. But the Kabbalah is not really belonging to the Hebraic faith alone. The Kabbalah itself is the received teaching as we are told the word means. And therefore, it is the received teaching that any family of human beings have received at any time in the history of mankind throughout its evolution from the greater teachers. Therefore, it exists in the Taoist philosophy, it exists in the Hindu philosophy, it exists in the ancient Greek philosophy, in the ancient Egyptian philosophy. And so, we must not confuse the reality that although the most current books that we have on the Kabbalah have the actual terms of the Hebraic language, nevertheless, the principles that actually underlie it are present in all major religions. So, having said that, let us focus a little bit more on these special times of our current situation. Imagine what people would feel if they were actually living in that event when the Buddha was manifested on earth or the Christ was manifested on earth. And each one of these events marked one of these changeover cycles. We are currently living in one of these changeover cycles. During those changeover cycles, which happen every 2,000 years approximately, there is also a greater cycle which happens every 24,000 years. Now, we are actually at present in the midst of that changeover of the smaller cycle of 2,000 years and one of the grander, bigger cycles of the 24 to 25,000 years. Now, what does that mean in actual real terms? It means that during those changeover times, there is a tremendous influx of greater spiritual intensity of energies to inaugurate that new age and the new possibility. How is that done? In the same way that when we buy a house and we f find that it has old electrical system in it, which cannot handle the greater current of electricity that new equipment such as televisions, internets, and all the rest of it require, we actually rewire the house. We upgrade the electrical circuit. 
Now, our planet Earth is going through this upgrade of the electrical circuit currently. This produces tremendous shifting in the whole ecological and atmospheric conditions. And the climatic conditions, of course, also change tremendously too. And we can see the increased movement of uh, uh, these uh, great winds that produce uh, the tidal waves, and they are threatening that the, the possibility is that another major uh, tidal wave may be generated that will hit the American coast in some time. They don't know exactly the time, but they are prophesying that they would actually have such a condition to uh, endure. Earthquakes are actually on the increase. We are already experiencing some freak conditions in our own country here in England. In Sussex, where I live, the roads were absolutely became rivers, and people were actually swimming and uh, going on boards on their own high streets. Now, these are not ordinary conditions. You know, an old man on the TV was saying, I have lived for, you know, 70, 80 years here, and I've never heard, I've never seen, I've never experienced anything like it. So it is very important that we actually begin to see the signs that we are living in the midst of tremendous change. This change we witness exoterically in these climatic changes. However, inwardly also, we have the possibility to absorb the new dynamic the new electromagnetic grid for our own constitution so that we may have the opportunity to expand our consciousness and unfold in an accelerated way our inherent potentiality. So the purpose of this changing of the electromagnetic grid of our planet is really so that organic life can accelerate its evolutionary journey because higher spiritual energies require better, more effective channels, and a higher quality of matter or substance through which the force and the spiritual energy may flow. So the great teachers of humanity which guide the human evolution, when there are certain changes like that, they endeavor to intensify their own efforts to manifest teachings, to uh, give old wisdom in a new way so that minds can absorb it and applied to accelerate their journey of evolution. So we have an opportunity, and this opportunity is to open our hearts and minds to that new dynamic. And the whole talk about today is not only for information's sake, but really to touch that depth of reality in our hearts and minds and say, well, how are we to engage with this new event? Because you do understand that uh, uh, every time such a major event has happened, not every human being on the planet has actually received the new dynamic. We still have currently upon this planet people living in the sort of semi-savage stage of evolution. So those who are open can absorb the new dynamic, can be inoculated, if you like, with the, that new dynamic of energy, or we may remain closed and go on in the same way as we have done. So there is a natural evolution on a major river of evolution that all humanity is flowing. However, if we are able to absorb this greater intensity of energies, then we can accelerate that evolution. And the whole purpose of the greater teachings that have been given at those changeover times have been to call to attention the human minds to absorb the new message so that they can accelerate their evolution. Because through the slow evolution, humanity suffers more. That is why the Lord Buddha said that um, all life is sorrow. Because constantly, we may build beautiful things, and time tears them down, shocks of existence, of sickness, and all manner of other things, teach us that life in the material world is suffering. And liberation from that suffering is not necessary not living in a material plane, but learning how to live on the material plane in perfect harmony with the natural laws of evolution. When we go against these natural laws of evolution, there are consequences. And the consequences the Indians have called karma. We call it in the West the law of cause and effect. And so understanding the laws which the Kabbalah is teaching allows us to live more in harmony with life itself and thereby enjoy the beauty and goodness and truth of life. And that is why in the Old Testament we have this uh, beautiful demonstration of the whole evolutionary journey 
in a racial way as well as individual way depicted in a symbolical and allegorical form. We have uh, the mystery of the, uh, the tree of knowledge, the tree of good and evil, and what that actually means. We also have the whole journey of the Israelites going to Egypt. If you read Genesis and the chapters of Moses and so on, you will see that the Israelites, by their own choice, actually went to Egypt because they thought that they will have greater employment and greater fertile lands there. That symbolically means that consciousness, spiritual consciousness, goes into the material plane by choice. And the material plane is symbolized by Egypt. But then, by virtue of becoming immersed in material substance, it actually becomes engrossed and enslaved in it. So the enslavement of the Israelites symbolized that enslavement of the spirit consciousness in matter. After a period of time of that enslavement, there arises the consciousness of wanting to be free, to liberate ourselves from that limitation that matter puts upon our consciousness. And so the struggle to uh, make the exodus, to liberate themselves from the Egyptian uh, limitation. Now, they traveled for 40 years in the wilderness. And it's a bit like that. We get a glimpse of wanting to be free from the material limitations, but then we have to seek to find the truth. And we seek the truth here and there and everywhere. We go through the supermarket of religions, the supermarket of ideologies, yes, and we look for one or other. So this is the journey in the wilderness. And then we have to make the conquest of the Holy Land. The Holy Land symbolizes that higher state of consciousness, like the Israelites did. And what is the first city that they actually attacked? The first city was Jericho. And they went around Jericho seven times. And Jericho means doubt. And so the first thing that we have to conquer in ourselves when we get a glimpse of something spiritual is the doubt. Because our minds, so tainted by the materiality of life, do not necessarily accept the hint, the silent voice of spiritual suggestion. And so we doubt it. And we have to conquer that doubt. And having conquered that doubt, the Israelites then went after the next city, which was called A. And A symbolically means the personal self. And we have to conquer the personal self. And if you read in the Old Testament, it's something very, very interesting. Having conquered Jericho, having conquered doubt, they actually assumed that they didn't need all their strength to conquer A, i.e. Personal, the personal self, the personal will. Because we have to conquer the personal will and then surrender it to the divine will. The Egyptians thinking that that was an, uh, the Israelites thinking that that was an easy task, they didn't master all their forces and they went with a smaller strength and they failed. All too often we think that we can conquer our personal will, our personal desires, but it is necessary that we invoke the whole presence of the I am, of all that we are, to conquer these personal attachment to things, the personal desires to things, the personal involvement in the material world, the personal investment. You know, when you have an investment in something, it's very easy to, give it, to, to, no, uh, to think that you can give it up, but you cannot give it up. It's very, very difficult. The more interest you have in something, the more difficult it is to give it up. The more investment you have made, the more attached you are in it. If you have made a great investment in a company and you have poured an enormous amount of money and you have X equity that you own, it's very difficult to just say, ah, I give it up, I go. So it is for our minds, which has invested an enormous amount of time and energy working with matter, it is very difficult for it to let go and trust some little hint of inner spiritual suggestion. That's why we often doubt it. Of course, a healthy degree of skepticism is also necessary because there is too many false suggestions and too many false prophets and too many false teachings which actually are more interested in what you have in your pocket rather than what you have in your mind or your heart. And so we do need a healthy dose of skepticism, but it is different to actually be prudent and cautious 
and have in your heart that suggestion of the Buddha that says, do not believe a thing because some great one supposedly is saying it. Do not believe it because it is written in some scripture. But only when your own consciousness has inquired into it, has seen the value in it, it makes sense, and then take it on board, absorb it, make it yours, become one with it, and actually apply it in all aspects of your life. And that is the message of the teaching of the tree of life. It is intensely practical. It is intensely to do with our current times. For that which is true, it has always been true. It will always be true. And it will always have a value in our lives. Loving your neighbor, it is not only valid for 2,000 years ago. It is as valid today as it will be in several thousand years from now. But what is important about this time, as opposed to other times, is the fact that we are living in a totally different world. Information that was communicated by teachers in the past had to take enormous amount of time to travel from one place to another. Whereas now, instantly, information can travel throughout the world. Whatever happens in New York, it's already known within minutes or hours in, in uh, Tokyo. And so the communication explosion is another phenomenon of these changes that are being brought up by the whole new cycle. And so these changes affect us in every aspect of our lives. And absorbing the new dynamic also means being able to apply specifically and appropriately the simple messages and truths of the ancient philosophies, whether they are of the Kabbalah, whether they are of the Buddhism, whether they are of theosophy, whether they are of Christianity, for all of these are really reflections of the one diamond truth. In the same way that all the rivers of the world give up themselves in the vastness of the ocean, so all the different religions and ideologies give themselves up to the oneness of truth. And when we actually absorb and understand that reality, then we will not argue and say, well, this philosophy is better than that, or this teaching is better than that, but rather, instead of theorizing of it, apply it, and then draw the richness that comes from it. And so, why do we choose the tree of life? Why have they chosen, the ancient ones, the tree of life? It is a symbol, and it is a very apt symbol, because just like a tree has a seed that it starts from, and the seed is planted into the ground, in the same way, the spirit, which is a seed, is planted into materiality, and then it has to spring roots and a stem, a trunk, branches, leaves, flowers, fruits, and then it becomes a seed again. And this whole journey of involving of the spirit into matter and then evolving out into manifesting the full fruits, i.e. the inherent potentiality of that spirit consciousness, is depicted in all the Bibles of the world, whether we talk the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the esoteric Kabbalah, all of these teachings are attempting in one form or another to convey that simple message. And so this intensification of the spiritual energies are, we said, for two reasons. One, to upgrade the electromagnetic grid of our planet, and therefore our own constitution, because the material of our constitution is drawn out of our planet. We are not made up by material from Venus, or from Mars, or from Jupiter, or from Andromeda. We are made from materials drawn from our planet. So as the planet's material is being upgraded, so our own material is being upgraded to allow this greater influx of energies. And along with that comes the reality that if we absorb the spiritual energies, and apply the keys that are inherent in the wisdom of the mysteries, then we can accelerate our evolution. We can expand our consciousness. So what is actually consciousness? We use this word so often, what does it mean? At one level, if you read in the dictionary and you ask what it means, they say, well, it's awareness. And then you look at awareness and it says consciousness. So what, what is that consciousness? It comes etymologically from uh, the Latin, con and seo. Con meaning with and seo meaning knowledge. So that with, with which we know implies from the Latin word. So it is that aspect 
in our constitution with which we know. Another interpretation of consciousness or meaning of consciousness can be the ability to respond to impulses, internal or external, to impacts of energy, internal or external. So consciousness is that aspect of the self with which we are capable of responding. So consciousness exists at every plane of manifestation, from the atoping up to the absolute, because it has emanated as a seed, we said, from the absolute, from the source of all, descended into dense materiality, and therefore the omnipresence of the oneness of life, or, or God symbolically, is in the dense materiality as it is in the finest spirituality. And so we have atomic consciousness, we have chemical consciousness, we have instinctive consciousness, we have sentient consciousness, we have intellectual consciousness, intuitive consciousness, volitional consciousness, cosmic consciousness, universal consciousness and absolute consciousness. Ten levels of consciousness. And within those levels of consciousness, all aspects of consciousness are actually included. And these are the ten spheres of consciousness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And what it means when we say about expanding our consciousness, it means that we can incorporate in our consciousness more of the influences and potentialities that belong to these other realms of consciousness. So if spirit consciousness is in the dense materiality, it's symbolized by this earthly sphere, it's called the earth sphere, meaning the earth substance, the densest point of manifestation of the spirit consciousness. Then it has to go beyond that, you know, and through evolution, consciousness has incorporated within itself the potentiality of that chemical interaction, and then the instinctive level of consciousness, then the sentient, and most of us still gravitate along that vibrational arc of the sentient instinctive, and we also touch the intellectual. And maybe from time to time we have a hint of intuitive perception. Only a hint though. So expansion of consciousness means to actually expand our consciousness to incorporate the potentiality that is inherent within the intuitive state of consciousness as an everyday occurrence, to live the intuitive way constantly. And living in the intuitive way constantly, it means not to have to argue about whether this is right or that is right. Because the mind, the intellect, has to actually have proof and it has to actually have the, the facts and figures that confirm a certain statement of truth. Whereas intuition has the capacity of seeing the reality as is without having to have the evidence. And that is why so many times sages and wise advanced beings who have attained that state of consciousness in an earlier cycle of evolution are able to speak about truths and prophesy matters that science, through the intellectual application of their consciousness, finds out much later. And so expansion of consciousness is simply raising our center of gravity in our consciousness from a lower state into a higher state. And so other teachers may call it the raising upon the planes of consciousness. I call it expansion of consciousness because the more your consciousness expands, the more inclusive it actually becomes of your greater potentiality until you actually attain that state of having fulfilled and realize that inherent potentiality in you which Plato called perfection. So perfection of any unit of consciousness is to realize its inherent potentiality. So what is the inherent potentiality in the human consciousness? If it is truly made in the image of God, in the image of that source, and the source is the absolute, then the inherent potentiality of the human consciousness is absolute. In other words, infinite. And therefore, the expansion of consciousness is infinite. And so, if we are able, through a certain intensification of paying attention, of observing, of applying all our faculties, of training them to the finest tuning, 
in the same way as once uh, being in, a, an, in an auction. I remember a story which conveys the message very, very simply. That the auctioneer, very, very experienced, he sold most of the things. And then he came up into an old kind of a, uh, a violin that was sort of scratched and battered, and he thought it was hardly his worthwhile to sell it. But, you know, he was a professional, so he lifted it up and he said, well, what are you to bid for this? Somebody said one pound. Only a pound, he said. Two pounds, said another. Only two pounds, said he. Three, said another. Only three pounds for this excellent violin, said he. And then, just as he said only once, twice, and just about when he was to say three times, a gray hair, beautiful lady came in, picked up the violin, tuned it a little bit, dusted it, and played a beautiful sound. When she finished and the violin was placed down, the wily auctioneer picked it up and said, What am I to bid for this now? 1,000 said one, 2,000 said another, 3,000 said another. Once, twice, three times, the violin was sold for 3,000. What actually transformed it? Some people smiled and cheered and they were so pleased because they saw the message, the truth. And others said, Well, what happened? It's the same old violin, it doesn't mean anything. And swift came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. It was the touch of the master's hand. And so this old violin that we have, this old physical form that we have, this old emotions that we have, this old mind that we have, filled with all manner of things, what it needs is a little bit of tuning, a little bit of dusting, a little bit of polishing. It does not mean to throw it away and get another one. That's what we do every time we wear it down. We don't attain very much. And then we come back to get another violin, to start all over again. That's what incarnation is all about. So why come back again to learn the same lessons, to suffer the same things, to have the same pain? It's very boring. Life is not meant to just repeat the same mistakes, the same lessons over and over again. Life is meant to actually be, live, be lived in the edge, to be lived in the vigor to constantly reveal greater aspects of the unknown, greater aspects of that absolute to come into manifestation, to expand our consciousness and realize more of that inherent potentiality of the absolute, not to repeat the same lessons. So how are we going to tune and dust and polish our physical form, our astral and mental form? Well, the first step is to recognize that it requires that. Because all too often people assume that they know it all. And if you know it all, how are you going to really hear or absorb anything of value from another? It's to accept that we all have our varying degrees of limitations. We all have our varying degrees of ignorance. An expansion of consciousness is also, in another way, means to expand the limitations of ignorance, to go beyond the limitation of ignorance, to break those limitations, to break the chains of ignorance and to be free. We think we have free will. How much of our free will really is being exercised? Because most of the time we are governed by the instincts and by our desires and by our senses and that whole sensual experience controls enormous amount of our living and thinking and way of life. And so where is the free will in that? Truly free will comes into being when not only have you recognized that your, your constitution requires polishing and tuning, but have begun to engage with a process of refinement, of integration and alignment so that it becomes surrendered then to that innermost divine consciousness that you are to be played by the beautiful musician, which is your divine consciousness. And so, what is important is first of all to acknowledge that our instrument needs tuning. Secondly, to begin the process of tuning, and that means acknowledging and integrating our physical with our emotional and mental vehicles. In other words, integrating and acknowledging this sphere, which is the mind, that sphere, which is the emotions, this sphere, which is the instincts, this sphere, which is the physical body, that sphere, which is our loving nature, our will, our higher emotions, and 
working with these aspects of our consciousness in one harmonious whole. When we act as a whole being, then we can relate with the wholeness of life and be in harmony and enjoy the beauty and blissfulness of living. But when one part of ourselves is pulling in one direction, whereas another is pulling in another direction, then we have conflicts. We suffer the conflicts. We suffer the pain that comes out of these conflicts. And these conflicts produce the various diseases that we suffer. And so healing is another part of the study of the tree of life. So it's so vast that it can be interpreted and worked from the healing standpoint. It can be interpreted and worked from the psychological standpoint. It can be worked from the actual ritual standpoint. It can be understood from the standpoint of the metaphysics, from the standpoint of the science, of the different arts that exist. So it is actually all-encompassing, and all of these can be incorporated within the study. They are the different branches of the tree of life. We spoke of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, and the tree of life. The tree of life is referred to by St. John in Revelations. And he says that he who eats of the fruit of the tree of life shall know no longer suffering, shall know no longer darkness and light, shall know no longer all the ignorance that symbolically night is referred to, and light meaning the spiritual knowledge. For he shall be at one with the source of all knowledge. So the tree of life is the symbol of oneness. The tree of knowledge is the symbol of duality and separateness. If your consciousness is attached to the principle of separateness, then it will produce more of the children of separateness and therefore suffer the consequences of that. However, if your consciousness begins to vibrate in tune with the principle of oneness, then more of that unifying principle will flow through your heart and mind and manifest that at one man in your consciousness that is in perfect harmony, that is able at any one time to see the good, to manifest the good, to see the beautiful, to express the beautiful, to know the truth and live in the true way. And so when we in the earlier stages of our involution, had to separate from the oneness, the force of separateness was absolutely perfect. Because the force of separateness is not evil. It is an absolutely divine force, just like the force of unification is a divine force. And Kabbalah is endeavoring to explain and convey that message. But what we need to do is to realize that the force of separateness needs to be used where it belongs and where it it is appropriate to be applied because when you take the force of separateness out of where it belongs and you apply it where it does not belong, that is where evil comes in. When unity, when togetherness, when group consciousness, when the spirit of cooperation is what is needed and someone deliberately brings dissension and brings the spirit of separating so that he can rule, that is where the evil comes in. When a dictator separates into different uh, pockets, and makes one fight the other so that they can be weakened, so that he can constantly control them, that is evil indeed. But the separating force is necessary. When a fruit ripens, it must be separated from the tree, and it falls down and then becomes the very substance from which the tree draws to grow the new cycle of fruit. And so life moves in this rhythmic motion from the center to the periphery and back to the center again, i.e. from seed into the unfolding of the whole tree and fruit, and back to seed again. And we can see the reality of that in our own constitution. The roots is the physical form. The trunk is our astral form. The branches is our mental form. The leaves is our emotional nature. The actual fruit is our spiritual nature. And the seed again is our divine inherent consciousness, the divine inherent God, the God imminent within us. And this is also existing in the cycle of all humanity as well. There is the savages of the world, and these are the roots of the tree. There is the civilized human beings, which is the trunk of the tree. There are those which are the talented individuals, which are the branches of the tree. There are the saints, which are the leaves of the tree. There are the advanced initiates of the world, which are the 
flowers of the tree, and then there are the perfected beings, such as the Christ and the Buddhas and so on, which are the true seeds, which have re completed that cycle of evolution upon this planet. And so we are in that process of actually having involved into matter, now evolving out of matter, and so what belonged in the journey of involution is contrary to this journey of evolution for us. And so, how do we actually differentiate the forces of involution from the forces of evolution? Well, all your jealousies, your hatreds, your actual uh, uh, forces of uh, um, anger and fear, and all of these, all of these are actually forces of separateness. All of these are only a phenomena of the illusion that you as a consciousness is separate from the source of all potentiality, of all power, of all goodness, of all truth that is life itself. Life is the source of all and everything. You cannot show me, imagine, or think anything that has not emerged out of life itself. And so if life is the source of all, and you are life, then the source of all and everything is in that which you already are. And any message of a true teacher is always to guide human beings to realize that inherent potentiality in the life that they are. And so essentially, what we are talking about in the tuning of the violin and the dusting and polishing of the violin is realizing that these forces of separateness in ourselves, they are not actually to be suppressed, to be denied, or to be indulged in. But they are the very raw energies, the raw materials, which the tree draws out of the earth, and then by transmuting them and transforming them, produces the beautiful fruit. And the teaching of the tree of life is that science and that simplicity which allows a student or a human being who takes on board those principles and applies them to bring about that transmutation in his own living tree of his raw materials, which are those jealousies, hatreds, and angers and fears into the beautiful, compassionate energies of love, of compassion, of tolerance, of cooperation, of will for the good of the whole, and so on. So how do we bring about this transmutation and transformation? In the first place, we need to realize that we, that process must happen in the whole of our nature. And our nature includes the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. For these forces are reigning in all of these four worlds. These four worlds of our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual nature need to become beautiful, good, and true. In other words, to unfold in those four worlds our three divine attributes of consciousness, which is the energizing principle of the will, on the one hand, the beautifying principle that fuses in a harmonious way all things, which is the loving energy in us, and the differentiating principle which is our mind that analyzes and breaks things down into absorbable, uh, digestible pieces. It's like a menu. It's like, a, you know, when you go into a restaurant, you have a whole menu, and, uh, you know, if all of it was to come in front of you, you cannot eat it all at once. You have to eat a little bit at a time. And so the mind breaks down the wholeness into small portions that can be digested and can be absorbed. And so, we need to realize that within the tree of life, this also is present. These three pillars, from the top going down to the bottom, the middle one and the one on this side, these symbolize these three attributes of our consciousness, i.e. the will, which is the energizing principle, the love, which is the cohesive and unifying principle, and our mind, or the differentiating principle which analyzes, classifies, and separates. And these three attributes of consciousness have to be perfected in our four worlds, i.e. the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. They have to manifest and unfold the perfect beauty, goodness, and truth of their own inherent potentiality. But there is a problem. What is the problem? That they are being resisted. That nature i.e. the substance of which your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual natures are made up of, they resist these three energies. 
These three energies are known as inertia, restlessness, yes, inertia, restlessness, and rhythm. Now, of course, the will needs to be used to overcome inertia. You hear a beautiful talk, but then you go home and switch your TV and you think, oh, it's much more comfortable here. I don't want to come back for this other course. Oh, it's so nice. Inertia, laziness. So the will needs to be used, and you need to consciously make a decision and say, no, I will actually go. I will work in that group consciousness. I will endeavor to overcome that inertia. And that force of the will needs to be called into being. And it is called into being when you intend and you invest that energy with interest. And then through the intention and the interest comes the realization that actualizes and bridges the gap between the intention and the reality. So to intend something, all too often we intend so many things, but hardly realize very much. That is why we have to come back to go it all over it again, as I said earlier. And so it's important that actually we realize that nature itself, in its divine wisdom, has made it in such a way that is absolutely perfect. things did not resist us, then we will not call out of the depths of our own being the great energy that is required to overcome that resistance. Do you see how beautiful it works? And so the very resistance helps us to grow. If everything was just easy, we will never know who we actually are. That's why very often people who are born in very rich families, they're not necessarily always take the best advantage. And others who are born in very poor environments very often self-made men and women have been born in rather poor environments. And the very poverty and the very resistance of that has propelled them to so more intensely be energized to realize more and attain more. And so sometimes the apparent difficult karmic conditions that we face are the very opportunity for us to unfold greater aspects of our consciousness. And so divine wisdom has never given to one what was meant for another and never given you more than you can actually handle or less than you merit. It always gives you exactly what is appropriate. And so we don't need anything other than what we already have. We do have consciousness which has its threefold nature, I will, love, and creativity. We do have our fourfold nature, which is the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, and we need to learn how, in manifesting the will, the love, and the creativity, we master the nature of matter so that we can become masters of matter. We can become lords of a matter. In the Indian philosophy, they say, let us realize that we are divine. The Advaitic philosophy, we are divine. We are gods. Just know that you are God. But just saying that, just repeating that a thousand times in your mind does not necessarily make you a lord or a master over the material realm. In the West, through the whole business of actually mastering materiality, we're endeavoring to conquer matter. To conquer matter, it is necessary to understand the nature of matter. It is necessary to work with it to certainly draw the raw materials like we do in our factories, drawing the raw materials from nature and then producing beautiful instruments that we use in everyday living. So it is for us, we must draw the raw materials of our own earthly nature, which are those jealousies, hatreds, angers, all of these forces are really your raw energies, your raw materials. It is the wood that would actually need to be added into the fire so the fire becomes brighter. So the fire of your consciousness becomes more illuminating. So if you have much of that, rejoice. Because it means that you have a lot of raw materials in your nature. And all they need is just appropriate rechanneling, refining, applying. And knowing behold, you will have the beauty, the goodness and truth of your consciousness manifesting in your world, in your everyday relationships. For desire is only the personal reflection of the divine will. 
And so learning how to redirect the desire, and instead of desiring things for the benefit only of your personal separated self, desiring things that are good for the family to begin with, then for the community, then for your nation, then for the whole of humanity, is the way by which desire is being refined and is made into that divine will that always wishes and wills that which is good for the whole. And so expansion of consciousness means to really vibrate within your consciousness with that principle that is always seeking to do that which is appropriate for the good of the whole. Not only for the few, not only for the greater number, for that is also a philosophy that has been given to people. It is said by one that to do the good means to do that which is good for the greater number of people. What about the lesser number of the people that are left out? If you leave any part of the equation out, you don't have the whole. And if you only the whole is perfect. And so do not deny any aspect of yourself. Learn how to make appropriate use of it. And knowing, behold, in acknowledging the whole, you will realize the harmony and beauty of the wholeness of life. And so the whole philosophy of the tree of life is to understand this threefold nature. As it unfolds itself in the de ten states of consciousness, the ten spheres, the three attributes of consciousness, the three pillars, and the four worlds, meaning our fourfold nature of the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. This fourfold nature exists in every field. In the business field, you have, first of all, the concept of something. Then, you design it. Then, you create a prototype. Then, it goes into mass production. And so these four worlds exist in all aspects. The world of emanations, as it is known in the Kabbalistic realm, the world of creations or archetypal designs, the world of formations of the prototypes, and the world of multiple expressions or outer expressions, which is the fourth, most denser, most outer world, the mass production world. And we have this fourfold nature in ourselves. So we are a living tree. So essentially, the teaching is very, very simple. And whereas in the past, one or other teaching endeavored to highlight one of the attributes of our consciousness, now it is possible at this time due to the intensification of the spiritual energies for all three aspects to be unfolded simultaneously, i.e. for our will, for our love, and our creative intelligence to work harmoniously and do that which Pythagoras has spoken of as the equilateral triangle. For his spiritual school in Crotona was also studying and teaching the tree of life. And his tree of life was a perfect equilateral triangle made up of ten dots. So, uh, this should be a little bit there. Yeah. So, what we are talking about is making that equilateral triangle in our consciousness. So that actually, our will, our love, and our creativity work in perfect harmony. So we don't have the attitude of a bully or uh, a, a dictator, which is too much will without love and without creativity. Or we don't have the overcritical personality, which doesn't have the love and it doesn't have the will, but is very, very critical. It can always see what is actually wrong in the part, but it cannot see what is good in the whole. It always sees good and says, that's mine. If it sees bad, it says, it's yours. And they're very good critics. They are lots of critics uh, of films, of art, of uh, everything else. But if you tell them, take a brush and start painting, or take an instrument and start playing, they know nothing about it. They haven't used their creativity, but they're very good critics. They know how to say this is beautiful and this is crap without evaluation of the real intensity and energy that has gone by the artist of actually producing that piece of artwork. So what we are talking about is learning how to bring these three energies into perfect equilibrium so that what is appropriate is manifested where it's appropriate in perfect harmony. 
The person who has too, you know, a lot of love, but he hasn't awakened the will, and he hasn't awakened the creativity, is uh, full of lovey-dovey, sensing the, the, what is wrong in the world, sensing the pain, the suffering, but they are totally ineffective. They can't do very much. And there are so many of those in the world which sense what would it be like if only, but they don't know how to engage with it. And so it is necessary that we balance these energies. We learn how to be willful, but in a loving and creative way. To be creative, but with plenty of energy to fulfill that intention that we have and fulfill and actualize that creative idea that we have. And we need the loving energy so that we do it for the good of the whole, not only for our separate self. And so all of these concepts, all of these realities belong to the teaching of the tree of life and the whole course that is to come and the uh, day event that is happening on Saturday. It's really to put into practice some of these ceremonial and rituals through which we build greater intensity of these energies in our consciousness so that they become easier. It's a bit like a habit, you know. It's easy when you have a habit to just keep repeating it. It comes naturally. You don't have to work very hard to actually be habitual. <laughs> it's very, very easy. But at some point, you did work to create that habit. And then it becomes automatic. Well, part of the journey of evolution is to learn to actually create beautiful habits, which are known as virtues, which are known as creative ways of living, harmonious ways of living. And certainly one who has attained that state of equilibrium is full of compassion, living compassion, that serves for the, good of, for the good of the whole and does all things for no reward. It's one who has wisdom, which is skill in action. It's one who has universal vision because he sees that all are fragments of the one and sees in the diversity the unity of life, as theosophy has put it. For theosophy was the inaugurator of this great age the harboring, and like St. John, who spoke about the Messiah that is coming 2,000 years ago, just before him. So Theosophy was the harboringer of this new age. And Theosophy endeavored to highlight this principle of the fusion and synthesis of the will, the love, wisdom, and the creative intelligence. And throughout these 2,000 years that will unfold before us, these threefold aspects of our consciousness will come to manifest that which imagination cannot even imagine now. Will come to manifest faculties which will be absolutely, tremendously only considered now as uh, uh, happenings from aliens. Teleportation will come to be part of the everyday living. Telepathy will be an everyday living occurrence. Certainly knowing what is in the heart, in the mind of another, will be a natural thing. Not, you will not need to cast uh, a few stones, call the runes, to find out what is going to happen tomorrow. You will not need to go to your astrologer to cast a chart so that you will know. Intuitively, you will know. What a new race will that be? Not made up out of black people or yellow people or blue people, but of people of all the races of the world. A race that incorporates the best of all and has left behind that which is already bypassed itself by date, so to speak. You know, there is a psychological attachment to holding on to things. We hold on tickets even after we already have used them, gone on the plane, gone on the bus, they're still in our bags, in our handbags. It's true. And it's the same with some of these forces in us. They no longer belong in this evolutionary journey. They were perfect in our evolutionary journey. We need now to let go of all the habits that belong with them and actually create new lines, new grooves, new designs, new perfect ways of interconnecting our brain cells so that we can manifest that new dynamic that is coming upon us. Let us open our hearts and minds and meet this new dynamic. 
You can say yes to it today. Begin the process today. Don't leave it for tomorrow as we very often do. This is why the Christian fathers, they thought human nature is such that we must take away reincarnation out of the biblical terms because otherwise they will all say, well, I'll do it next lifetime. So in their wisdom, they did that for a good purpose. But unfortunately, one good thing, when you don't see the whole picture, produces another bad thing. Because what it has produced is the fear of death and the tremendous suffering that comes from, from that. And uh, they compounded that with a false philosophy that, uh, you, you know, if you don't uh, do as I say, you go to hell. If you don't give all your money to the church, then you certainly are not going to go to heaven. And you know how much of that uh, has been the whole history of some of the uh, not so pleasant aspects of Christianity. Because the true message of the Christ was very, very simple, always. Sometimes priests endeavor to, to convince us of some dogmas that our imagination finds even incredibly difficult to accept. Yet we do accept the dogmas and we challenge others and we say, no, 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 you've got to believe in this dogma if you want to go to heaven. But essentially, why can we not invest in living the simple message rather than arguing about which dogma we should believe in or not. It requires a little bit more effort, but it is the only means by which we can liberate ourselves from the pain and suffering of being slaves in the land of Egypt. Israel and the Israelites are all the human beings who want to live in the light, in perfect harmony with the law, in perfect harmony with the oneness of life. The Israelites are not the Jews. Is is from Isis. Ra is the God, the sunlight, the radiance of the sunlight. And El is symbol of God. That's why you have Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel. And so the Israelites were those human beings whose hearts and minds were open and ready to receive the truth, the true message, ready to be uh, shown the way to live in harmony with the law, ready to be liberated from Egypt, i.e. from dense materiality and the thaldrum and slavery of materiality. Matter is beautiful when you are a master of it, when you are a lord over it. And there are such beings living today who have mastered greater aspects of that material plane, such as one, in India living today, Sai Baba, you may have heard the name, a very wonderful being, done tremendous work for the benefit of mankind, many hospitals and all sorts of wonderful things. I'm not a devotee of Sai Baba, but I am a devotee of every human being who does what is good for the whole. And if all of us began to live a life more with that spirit in our hearts, our world will be such a different world to live in and then we will not have Jews fighting and killing Palestinians and Palestinians killing Jews and wanting to exterminate and terminate each other. But they will together do what is good for all the people of their land. And the land belongs to all of us. The Holy Land is that divine state of consciousness in which there is harmony. It is not in Israel, the Holy Land. It's in your consciousness. The Holy Land is wherever you touch the spirit of that goodness of truth and beauty and share it and express it and manifest it in your relationships. How are we to do that? Well, the most direct route that is most harmless. It must be the direct route, but a direct route must be also harmless. The direct route may be from here to go to Brighton, you know, driving and and taking all the buildings down, but it is not the most harmless. So you must find the direct and yet the most harmless route. You must find that philosophy that actually is not separatist. It does not inspire you to be separatist and think that I am the elect, the special, the Illuminati, and everybody else is a nobody. I'll tell you the joke of the nobody. There was this rabbi, wonderful rabbi. He got so inspired in his teaching he said, I am a nobody. I am a nobody. I'm really, really a nobody. 
And then he was so passionate with that reality that everybody else started saying, I'm a nobody too. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. The sermon finished and they were going out of the synagogue. And then the janitor said, I'm a nobody. And a woman with a fair coat heard it and said, hmm, look who thinks she's a nobody. We like to make labels of things. We like to make labels of things. Even a nobody became a label. Let us not make a label of things. Let us not make a label of Kabbalah. Let us not make a label of theosophy. Let us not make a label of love. Let us live the simplicity of life. And in living it, enjoy the beauty, the goodness and truth of it. So thank you very much for listening to this... uh, whatever. If you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to any of them. Thank you very much, Janis. How much shall we give them out of 10? Fire from the belly. 12 out of 10? What do you think? (laughs) Right. Uh, Anyone who has questions, we take you first. Anyone who has comments, could you come later? So, questions first, anyone? Well, there are many students of the Kabbalah who have added. Maimonides was a, a very, very good student of uh, Kabbalah in Spain uh, in the 1200s, who actually gave a wonderful uh, teaching. Um, Abu Lafia is another individual who gave tremendous uh, impulse to the Kabbalistic uh, Tree of Life. You know, every student who comes to the study of the Tree of Life adds his own creativity, his own perceptions, his own interpretations. And so the tree is actually a living tree, constantly. Constantly it is actually added to, and constantly it grows and expands. And every student who brings his perceptions and his interpretations of it adds to the whole content of the tree of life. It's so vast. It's, uh, libraries are full of it. But uh, really the people that made it more public is this organization known as the Golden Dawn. Yes? You may have heard of the Golden Dawn organization in the 1800s. MacGregor Mathers. Uh, yes, yes. Late 1800s, early 1900s, yeah. So, MacGregor Mathers and uh, Wade and uh, uh, Dion and uh, all of, uh, yes, and, and Dee and all of these individuals, including even Alistair Crowley, our uh, good friend who uh, in some way got caught up in uh, one of these uh, uh, safe houses, he thought it was a safe house, called Drags, and uh, uh, he played around with it and lost his way in that, yet he actually inadvertently served the human uh, uh, thirst for knowledge because he published the lot of all of that uh, apparent sacred knowledge of the Kabbalah that was in that organization of the Golden Dawn given by teachers in the invisible realms. See, in the old days, Kabbalah was taught from student to student, from master to student, in a very much oral way. Yes? So you had the literal Kabbalah, you had the practical Kabbalah, you had the dogmatic Kabbalah, and you had the unwritten Kabbalah. This unwritten Kabbalah, a lot of it has already become known now, and is published in many books and many uh, papers. And Crowley was the first who actually started to publish all this material. So he did some good in that way. But a lot of... Uh, his uh, material is tainted by this vibration of his uh, um, lost way in the realm of drugs and in the realms of uh, uh, self-will rather than the will for uh, the good. Do as thou wilt was his God. Yeah? Yes, do as thou wilt, but there is a law. And the, and the doing of as thou wilt has consequences. And it's called the law of cause and effect. Yes? So as you sow, so shall you reap, says St. Paul. And perhaps that simplicity of the law, Crowley did not uh, take onto account. What is your point for making with Crowley uh, magical aspect? No, no, no. No, the point is uh, simply to say that uh, he served humanity in an inadvertent way, not because he consciously wanted to, but 
in actually breaking his oath that he had given to keep the knowledge that he received in the order of the Golden Dawn sacred, he broke that oath and published all the material that he had received. So I'm only mentioning it in the sense that he served by making available that information to the world. Not to say that he is a great teacher that you must all follow, yes? Okay. Do I practice magical rituals? I'm not a Wiccan. I don't know what uh, wickedry is. I suppose it's some kind of uh, uh, craft of using uh, energies and forces and so on, hopefully to, uh, towards the good of humanity. Uh, and uh, I'm not in any way prejudiced against the use of forces and energies for the good of humanity. But if we use forces and energies to manipulate the minds of others to serve our own selfish designs, then yes, that is inappropriate. And it is not something that I will personally promote. So what is magic? Magic is a conscious use of energy and force to facilitate the manifestation of the good and the beautiful. And divine magic is manifested in the magnificent harmony of the universe, of all the great heavenly bodies. So the divine magician is the God, the source within. And we can be also divine magicians if we manifest the magic of goodness, of truth and beauty in all our relationships. So yes, I am a magician, but in that respect, not in the respect of going uh, in the middle of the night in the forest and wanting to, to do something uh, that uh, will, uh, excuse me, that, that would actually in some way uh, make me uh, more powerful than you so I can manipulate to, your mind to serve me or anything like that. So that kind of magic is black magic. It's a magic that uh, wants to separate again, wants to be a servant of separateness, a servant of uh, uh, superiority and inferiority, and that is not the way of evolution. That is, belongs in the past. Those labels are no longer of value in our current time. Yes? Yeah, it's a little bit more comment than question, but that's all right. Well, yeah. yes, all right. Yeah, yeah. In your talk, you um, spoke a lot about the need for change. Yes. Now, it um, seems to me that the most positive or most successful changes have involved incorporating aspects of tradition and traditional ritual. I mean, for mm. example, um, Christianity took uh, a lot of what was best in Judaism, mm -hmm. Buddhism uh, from Hindu thought. Correct, uh, correct. And so on. So um, it occurs to me as well that the... Um, uh, say modern religious leaders who want to throw out um, liturgy and tradi traditional ritual, uh, politicians who want to um, change uh, institutions so they're no longer recognizable, mm. people who want to pretend that there are no differences between, between countries, um, are actually obstructing well, I, I, I think it's a very good point, it's a very good comment. Uh, we must not have change for the sake just of change. Yeah. Yes, we must have change because it is appropriate because it is that which can facilitate the whole. We must have change because that change will incorporate a greater aspect of that energizing principle, beautifying principle, and loving principle. That kind of change, yes. But the change just simply so that we can have a different color for the sake of having a different color, it's not the change that we are talking about. And those that simply perpetuate the change so one day we champion this flag, and the next day we champion that flag because apparently it's the most popular one, which is what politicians do very often, is uh, not the kind of change that we are talking about. We change that is actually an inner revolution, as Krishnamurti, another good student of theosophy, would say. An inner revolution that truly turns upside down our world. The world where we are governed by habit, that leads us to greater bondage in materiality, to change that and declare a revolution that is an inner revolution where we now create purposeful, beautiful habits that actually are liberating us from the thaldrum of that imprisonment in materiality and density. Yeah? So, thank you for your comment. And um, he was appealed to, to give up his 
the drive to make money, to make profit, and so on. This mm. is the world in which we mm. all grow up. Yeah. We're conditioned by mm. the external world and so on. All you're saying is correct. But, I mean, I grew up, I thought I had to have money. Yeah? Mm. Very important. And with money, there's other things I have to have. I'll mm. become egotistical, I'll become all these things. You know, what you're saying is right. How are you going to get these people to change? And all of that. When for thousands of years they've been doing the very mm. thing opposite to what you are saying in the in the Kabbalah. Yeah, this, this, this is a very good point, and I want to actually say about it, and thank you for presenting it to give me the opportunity to say. The appropriate use of money is another aspect of the teaching of the Tree of Life. To realize that money is only a symbol of creative energy, and the more we learn how to apply that creative energy, the more that symbol of money, which is an outward and visible sign of that inward and invisible reality of creativity will come into being for us. And if there was a tycoon in this room, I would not say to him, don't be a tycoon. I will say, be a tycoon, but for the good of the whole. Learn how to be a good and better steward of the money and facilitate greater employment, greater wealth for all the people of Earth. And that is the spirit, not he who is good at making money, to abandon being good and ma making money and actually try and be loving and go and uh, do now in Ethiopia, uh, taking wheat uh, from one plate and putting it to another for the starving people, yes? He is good at making money. Let him make as much money as he can make and then donate large sums of that so that other people can do this and give to the starving. And so I will inspire him to do more of what he does but in a harmless way so that that which he generates does not steal from Peter to give to Paul so that he can appear glorious and being very uh, well thought of. Because very often that's what uh, uh, catches the rich people and the people that make money. They actually do a little bit of charitable things, not because of the spirit of charity living in their hearts, but because they can be more popular. And I will endeavor to actually call them to attention and teach them about the law of karma, teach them about the law of cause and effect so that they can do the good works but do them in the right spirit and the benefit that they will have then is a finer moral quality in their hearts as well as infinitely greater amount of money because truly money is a creative energy and the more we learn how to use the creative energy the more money we shall have it is not evil to have money it is not bad to have money it is what you do with the money and for what purpose you put in service the money that may be evil and bad. And I'm talking in simplistic terms, but that is the essence of it. Yes, earn money. Yes, generate more of that creative energy, but learn to manifest it, to use it, to employ it for the good of the whole, to the degree that you can in your own world. So I will, I do talk to businessmen. They come to me to see me for healings, for counseling, and this is the philosophy I teach them. And they do change. There was one Irishman that met Mr. Clinton, he said, wow, what a powerful man. So what a strong man. And he was suffering, he, this businessman, living right now in the uh, city, running a very, very powerful business, came to see me for a healing problem. And we talked about the philosophy of money, the philosophy of using it appropriately. And we talked about the various acts and ways that he used money and how that created the illness and the sickness that he was suffering. And when he absorbed that philosophy, that understanding, recently only he called me and he would say, it's so wonderful, I feel so good, I am healthy, I am well, and my business is doing even better. Because he put into practice some of those principles. But we have to change them in ourselves first. Like St. Paul said, don't look at the little more that is in the eye of another. First of all, do something with uh, the big stick that is in your eye. In other words, what I'm saying is, if each one of us brings about that change in themselves, then, you know, society is made of many individuals, such as you and I. The concept of society is misleading very often. We have to change society. You cannot change society without changing the individuals. Yes? And so each one of us has the responsibility of bringing about this transmutation and transformation in ourselves. Then society automatically changes. It reminds me of this... Uh, concept of uh, uh, Bertram Russell, that man is in conflict with nature, man is in conflict with other men, and man is in conflict within himself. He has tried to resolve all the outer conflicts, but the more he tries to do that, 
the more conflicts come about. We have created orders for peace, and we have more wars. We have invested an enormous amount of money in having hospitals that deal with all the diseases, and we keep discovering more and more diseases. And he said it is only when the inner conflict, the inner struggle is resolved, then the outer conflicts will come to an end. Because the outer conflicts are only a phenomena of this inner conflict. And this is what the teaching of the tree of life is. And yes, ritual is necessary, ceremonial practice is necessary. Every time you shake hands, you are actually doing a ritual. You are exchanging energy in that. And if you were sensitive enough and aware, when you hold the hand of another, you will know what he vibrates with. When he, whether he is interested in the money in your pocket, whether he is interested in, uh, in uh, controlling you or using you, or he is interested to just see the excellence in your eye. If we look for the excellence that every human being has attained, I promise you, the world will be filled with excellence. Because every human being has in his heart a touch of excellence, a touch of beauty, a touch of goodness. We have to empower that. We have to see that. We have to see that ideal in the actual condition which is apparently limited in the temporary here and now. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, there is. I mean, we, on Thursday we start a little course, and then Saturday we have that all-day event. People who have an interest that can come tomorrow, and it will be more practical. It will not me, be me just me talking. It will be also you participating and doing some practice to internalize the philosophy. Because unless the, the philosophy is internalized and absorbed and actualized, the change, the inner change, the inner transformation does not happen. Receiving a lot of information is only the first step. Then we must go beyond that. So, yes, I can suggest some books. The Unfortunate Book um, of Mystical Kabbalah is a very good one. I don't know if uh, the library has it. We, you should have it. And another book is uh, uh, the Kabbalistic Symbolism of um, Mr. Gareth Knight. That's his uh, name. His real name is not Gareth Knight, but that's the name that he writes by. He's a good fellow. I've met him, uh, and uh, his book is very good. And, uh, yeah, I recommend it wholeheartedly. There is also another chap called um, um, Gray, and we should have some books of Gray here. He has passed away now. He is also a very good fellow uh, to read his books. And so these three people I recommend wholeheartedly. Dion Fortune, uh, Gareth Knight, and Gray. And you will find most interesting uh, uh, ways of presenting the Kabbalah in that. But books are very, very good friends to remind you of what you need to do. But they don't do it for you. Yes? They're very good friends. They can remind you. And you can keep reminding yourself, but for how long? For how many lifetimes? <laughs> we need to actually do also. And the doing happens when you come to a group which its purpose is to meet and work with the material and begin that inner change and begin to apply that then to take it on board, to meditate on it, to learn it, and then apply it in your relationships with your wife, with your children, with your friends, with your partners, and speak it, even if others will actually think, Listen, what's he talking about? It's crazy. I worked in the business. I run an organization, and we had people, and I would go to see other business people, and I would talk about this philosophy, and often they will say, well, it's, um, it's a nice ideal, but it's impractical. It's always some excuse. But I challenge people. I say to them, look, and this challenge I have given to many business people I have met. I say to them, take one quality for one month, and each day you wake up, immediately think of that quality. What does it mean? Bring to your mind certain moments and images of where that quality was present in you or in others. Generate it in yourself, and then whatever you do, making money, Yes, being a better wheeler dealer than your next friend, but do it with that quality, and you will see the miracle of change and transformation. And I give them the challenge. Say, in the end of the month, if you do this and you don't have it, then I lost the bet. You win. And I put money on it. And they all have, nobody has ever called upon the money. They have experienced the change. You know what I say? Take the quality of joy. Bring to your mind beautiful 
joyful moments that you may have experienced or you have seen in a film or whatever, then is, as your mind is absorbing that quality, begin to vibrate with that. Send it out to your friends, to your family, to your enemies. And then throughout the day, have it as a background vibration, whatever you do, and see how much more joyful, how much more smile, how much more of that uh, uh, vibrancy of beauty that joy re releases in one's life can be. Do it. I challenge you. I will do the Saturday course for you absolutely for free if in one month you call me and say, I practice this principle of every day thinking about joy, bringing into my mind moments of joy, experiencing them, drinking the quality and nectar of them, and then having it as a background in everything that I do, and I didn't experience any more joy. I didn't have more joyful things. If you do that, I'll, re I'll refund the contribution that you have paid. Such confidence <laughs> and such energy. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. you very much. We've had a wonderful evening, don't you think? Yeah. I'm sorry, if anyone has any more comments,